Hello, my name is Bugsy. If Dr. Bay's lectures have been confusing and difficult, don't you worry. Today, we're going to learn about retrosynthetic analysis. Stay tuned. Organic chemistry. Taught by Dr. Bay. Reaction mechanisms. Reacting to products. Retrosynthesis. Target deconstructing. Molecules. Spectroscopy. Pouring through the sky. Try up the theory fly. Give rise to the complexity of mind. Living on a dream. Across the seven seas. Learning about spectroscopy. Retrosynthesis uses a special arrow like this. When you do a retrosynthesis problem, you create a roadmap of how to make your target molecule. Here are some tips. Focus on what changed going from reactant to product. First, see if the number of carbons changed. Second, list out what new functional groups were added to the product. Third, Determine what reactions you know that are able to form the new functional growths. My name is Bugsy, and signing off. Thanks, Bugsy, for laying down the foundation of retrosynthesis. Now let's take a deeper dive on each of the tips that Bugsy just discussed. The first question you'll ask yourself in any retrosynthesis problem is, what's the same? To do this, you'll first count your carbons in both the target molecule and in your starting material. In this particular problem, the target molecule has nine carbons, while the starting material has five carbons. Then you'll note any heteroatoms or functional groups in the starting material. Make sure to also look at its carbon positions too. This starting material contains an alkene at the C1-C2 bond position. The next question you'll ask yourself is what's different about the starting material and the product? List out any new functional groups that were added to the product slash target molecule. If any of the functional groups or carbon positions changed, what was replaced and by what? Take note of how many of these new groups were also added. Also, take a look if there's any stereochemistry in the product too. As we determined earlier, our starting material has an alkene at the C1, C2 positions, but our target molecule or product has one nitrile group added to the C1 position as well as an ether group at the C2 position. And note that these two groups are anti to one another since they are both on opposite bond types. Now the third question you'll ask is what reactions do you know that can form these new functional groups? How can you add a nitrile group that is on a secondary carbon? Well, you could use an SN2 reaction with either NACN or KCN in a polar aprotic solvent. And how can you add an ether group? Well, there are several ways to do this. You could use an SN2 reaction with RO-, you could use oxymercuration demercuration with ROH, or you could even do a Williamson ether synthesis by turning an alcohol into a strong nucleophile. There are several routes that we can choose from so just pick one and then start exploring it. The key to retrosynthesis is that we have to think backwards. Remember, since these are retrosynthetic arrows, the left side is the target molecule and the right side is our starting material. So let's break down the target molecule and take it one step at a time. At every step, think about what reagent you know that can make this small part of the molecule. Highlighted in blue is the ether group with a terminal alkene that we're going to focus on first. We have to add an ether group at the C2 position, so let's do a Williamson ether synthesis to add the alkyl chain with a terminal alkene. In order to perform this reaction, we need an alcohol group at the same C2 position, but the stereochemistry shouldn't change. So don't worry about drawing the mechanism or writing down reagents yet. We'll do this at the end. For now, we're just going to brainstorm a possible pathway, so we'll just write down Williamson ether synthesis above the synthetic arrows. 
Now, continuing going backwards, we'll think about what the molecule looked like just one step before. So let's focus on this nitrile group highlighted in blue. In order to form the nitrile group and do an SN2 reaction with, let's say, NaCN, for example, we need a good leaving group in the step before. Also, remember that SN2 has an inversion of stereochemistry, so the leaving group should be on the opposite bond type as the nitrile group. So continuing along in our retrosynthetic pathway, the molecule right before this step could be a bromine leaving group on a dashed bond. Now just keep on going. How do we add a bromine and an alcohol group across an alkene? It may take multiple steps and there are several correct possibilities. So here's one example. An alcohol displacement reaction could be performed to change the alcohol group to a bromine group. And then the step right before that could be an anti-dial formation across the alkene. Now let's test our retrosynthetic pathway by drawing out all of the reagents in the forward direction, which is what we're more used to seeing. So let's start off with our alkene, then use MCPBA in the first step to form the epoxide, and then H3O plus in the second step to form the anti-dial. Then alcohol displacement with one equivalent of HBr occurs where only one of the bad alcohol leaving groups changes to a bromine on an opposite bond type. This is why the bromine is on a dashed bond in this case. Then SN2 will occur and only the bromine will be displaced since the second alcohol group is a bad leaving group. Also, SN2 has an inversion of stereochemistry, so the nitrile group will add on an opposite bond type as well. Now from this intermediate, we can perform a Williamson ether synthesis, where the first step uses a strong base to deprotonate the acidic hydrogen off of the alcohol group to form an O-, which is a strong nucleophile. Then in the second step, the O- can attack the alpha carbon of this alkyl group bromine leaves, and then we can form our product slash target molecule. So in summary, Bugsy's tips for retrosynthesis are first look at what's the same and what's different between your starting material and target molecule. To do this, you can count your carbons and list out any new functional groups that were added to the product. Then think about what reactions you know of that could form these new functional groups. Obviously, it's a lot easier being said than done, and retrosynthesis requires a lot of practice before you get the hang of it. But just take it one step at a time, break down the large molecule into small, manageable parts, and before you know it, you'll be a retrosynthetic queen. Bugsy's words, not mine. Organic.